Hey, what's up guys? Welcome to Mercy Hill this weekend. Excited to have you. Uh, before I dive into the sermon for today, I got a couple things I wanted to mention in terms of vision and where we're going. Uh, man, praise God. We're not talking about Mercy Hill reopening because the church never closed. I know I've said that many times. Y'all, we've seen some incredible things over the last couple of months, man, able to supply Hope Academy with Chromebooks. The most people that we've ever seen engaged in serving happened in the month of May in terms of outside of the walls of the church, man, through No More Spectators. I hear stories all the time. Uh, y'all heard a story this week about a young Mercy Hill couple, young child of their own that has just accepted a foster placement of about to be a teenage mom. Uh, just the, the, the stories that we see coming out of this show you that the spirit is moving. Y'all, the church never closed, okay? With that said, I do understand that we're talking about reopening our buildings, and, uh, and we did have to punt that a little bit. And I know um, that that is uh, disappointing to some, and it may not even be, uh, it may not make everybody happy or whatever. <clears throat> I wanted to say this today, y'all, I promise you this, there is nobody on the planet that looks forward to the opening of our buildings more than me, okay? And, and I get that, man, we don't make everybody happy with every decision that we make. The good news for me is I was never called to make everybody happy. <laughs> I was called to lead. And part of leadership sometimes is pivoting. One of my mentors says it like this, man, leadership is the ability to make mid-course corrections. And that's what we're gonna do right now. So we have had to punt a little bit in terms of uh, opening up our buildings, but that doesn't mean we're gonna do nothing. Actually starting this next week, y'all, we're gonna kick off some pop-up outdoor services, okay? So more uh, details that you guys can find online uh, about this, but the general idea is, you know, find, or hopefully kind of earlier in the morning, um, be able, you know, unless it's going to rain or something like that, you know, or, or storm early in the morning, y'all will have our service outdoors. We'll probably start at regional and then hopefully multiply to the campuses. That's kind of what I have in my mind. That is going to start uh, this coming weekend. So you guys be ready for that. Now look, we got to understand the drill, okay? It's July in North Carolina and we're about to be doing outdoor services. Uh, we just all have to understand what that means. Stay hydrated, okay? <laughs> bring, bring your sunscreen. I mean, it, it kind of is what it is. I'm not worried about that because I understand that many of our families do this every weekend at the soccer field, okay? You need to bring the stuff, bring the hat. I'm gonna be preaching in a floppy hat, all right? You need to do all the stuff um, that we can do to get ready, but man, bring a blanket, bring chairs, get all that ready, get there early so that your family can kind of carve out a space under a tree or whatever. Uh, man, we're just gonna have an incredible time worshiping the Lord outdoors and we ex are excited to kick this off and I can't wait uh, to see you guys coming up this coming weekend. All campuses this weekend is going to be at regional and then we'll hopefully maybe decentralize from there. Hey, it's going to be hot. We're going to deal with it. If it rains a little bit, we're going to sing in the rain, okay? If it lightnings, we will immediately cancel. I do not do lightning. All right, not gonna do lightning. You ain't never seen cancel culture like we will cancel if it starts lightning, okay? I know everybody's talking about cancel culture. Uh, we will cancel, because I'm not doing that. But apart from that, uh, we're gonna have a really good opportunity to get together and worship, excited for that. We're also gonna be kicking off a brand new sermon series. You guys remember Dysfunctional Church? Uh, we did that for 1 Corinthians. Well, now that turns into functional church as we dive into 2 Corinthians starting next week, all right? Let's dive in. We're going to be in Romans chapter 8. We've been 12 weeks, one chapter. It all comes down to this. Let me give you guys the big idea. There is no spiritual force that can separate you from the love of God. It is not only about affliction, distress, and persecution, but there is also no demonic force. Neither death nor life itself can separate those who have been joined to God through putting their faith in Christ. We have been united with Christ. We've been brought back into the family. Y'all, there is nothing that can separate us, okay? The love of God in our life is absolutely overwhelming, and that is where true freedom is. Not the fear that is associated with trying to build my identity on a career, or the fear that is associated with being scared to death of what people are saying about me, or the fear that comes from fearing discomfort and death and all of that. No, we don't have to have that fear. Instead, it is replaced by a freedom in our life. That fear is replaced by fortitude. We become uh, ones who are not flight, but fight. If you remember last week, that all happens through the love of God, giving us true freedom from these things uh, as we are uh, end up being built up and our identity is built up in him. We don't have to fear these things in the world anymore. That's the essence of Romans 8. Uh, that's why I love what our kids are doing through worship. Maybe some of you guys, I hope, are taking advantage of our weekend services with our kids. Listen, I know it ain't, I know it ain't, the, I know it ain't uh, exactly what we would all want to be doing. Um, it's not exactly getting all together and, and what we want to see them doing on the weekends. I get that. But hey, second best is so much better than nothing. 
Uh, part, of our, part of what we do in our family is, man, we get our kids all together, and part of our uh, routine is going through the worship songs with them and all that. Man, they're dancing around, they're having a good time, and we're trying to play it up uh, and, and really just be energetic with them. But I love that through this series, one of the songs they have been singing is this, we are the redeemed, we are the ones who are free. We belong to Jesus. All of Romans 8 captured in this little children's song that our kids are getting a chance to sing over and over and over again. Y'all, Jesus Christ sets us free by establishing our identity in him and promising us a future that is beyond the earthly horizon. And that creates a life that the world calls radical, but the Christian calls normal. It creates a life filled with risk and relying on God and leveraging your time, talent, treasure for a world that is coming and a kingdom that you already say is not your own. It creates generosity, no more spectators, a concern for the nations. It all flows from this idea that we are free, not because of how tight we can hold on to God, but because God is never gonna let us go. There is no sin, suffering, or Satan, the three S's. There is none of that that can separate us from the love of God. And y'all, it creates a freedom to run hard in this life. Y'all, the enemy's plan is to destroy that in you. Either take that testimony away, instill that fear back into you, to make you think, man, if I misstep here, or if we suffer in this way, or maybe the demonic forces that are attacking me, they can separate me from God. And when that happens to us, we end up living in fear instead of freedom. We don't live that radical Christian life. And what the Bible is calling us to in this one last kind of triumphant uh, jubilation that, that, uh, that, that Paul has is he kind of exclaims, there's nothing that can separate us. Y'all, here's the news flash. Nothing separates us. It ain't happening. You got to bind the strong man if you're going to take his stuff. And nothing is big enough to take us out of the hands of God. Sin ain't, suffering ain't, death ain't, spiritual forces, they are not. And that's what we're gonna get into uh, today, all right? We will live a different type of life when this gets into our bones. So let's get after it. Let me show you. Here we go, Romans 8, starting in verse 37. Now, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to do, uh, will be able to separate us from the love of God and Christ Jesus our Lord. I'm going to begin this week how we sort of ended and talked a little bit about last week, this idea of no more conquerors. Now, uh, newsflash, these two passages totally go together. Last week was part A, this week is part B. In the old days at Mercy Hill, I just would have stood up here and preached for an hour and 20, okay? But none of us are as young as we used to be, all right? And so uh, we decided to break this thing up into two. And now that we're breaking it up into two, I just want you to see that all kind of hangs together. Okay. There was a list more than conquer. And then another list about things that can't separate us from God. It all sort of hangs together. What is this idea about uh, not being, you know, what is this idea about being more than a conqueror? Well, it's as simple as this. We talked about it last week. A conqueror wins more than a conqueror subjugates. Now, what does that mean? It means that he doesn't just defeat the enemy. He takes the enemy's tactics. He takes the enemy's will and turns it against himself, turns it against the will of the enemy. You could say it like this. Satan's schemes end up serving God's purposes for our good and his glory. He's coming at us for separation. And all he does is build our relationship up, our endurance up, our testimony up. You think about what John Piper said. I thought this was so strong. Affliction raised his sword to cut off the head of Paul's faith. But instead, the hand of faith snatched the arm of affliction and forced it to cut off part of Paul's worldliness. What Satan was trying to separate ends up being something that God uses to bring godliness and humility and love and build our relationship with him even more. What the enemy sows to break us can make us. That's what we said last week. What was supposed to implant fear implants fortitude. Now, this is how we get into the stuff for today. That is only true if we are fully convinced that nothing can separate us, okay? It's only true that we see suffering and sin and Satan in our life coming at us from every direction. It is only true that those things become something that God uses and that we become more than conquerors if it's true that nothing can separate us. And that's what Paul says. He says, I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. In other words, we are more than conquerors because whatever the enemy sows for our discouragement, we will reap for our confidence knowing that whatever happens in this life happens for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. We will never be separated from God's love. And it changes the way we act. 
If we don't know that in our bones, we won't live in the freedom that is the radically normal Christian life. We act more like conquerors when we know there is nothing able to separate us from God's love. Y'all, I played football a long time in my life, okay? I played from probably seventh grade all the way through college. And uh, back then there was no rules in terms of like hitting people and the, you know, all these rules that have come out now that probably are good for the game or whatever. But I think about there was no rules back then. And so I was a receiver and what all of the defenders were taught was this phrase, separate that man from the ball. Meaning if you catch it, the defender is supposed to fly as hard as he can, launch himself like a missile and hit you so hard that you physically cannot hold on to the ball. You separate the man from the ball. And when you do that, he either doesn't catch it or it's a fumble. And I was on the wrong side of that, okay? Cause I was on offense and I was the one that was getting separated from the ball or whatever. Y'all, the idea in this passage is that there is nothing that will separate us from God's love. There is nothing that can hit hard enough to separate us from God's love. And if that is true, then those things that do hit us real hard, we can rest assured will be there to build our endurance, dependence, character, our testimony, okay? <clears throat> I had a friend talk to you this week. Man, he planted the church in a tough part of the country, okay? I'm talking about the soil is hard uh, in, the, in the Northwest, very rural area. He planted the church there a few years later. Uh, he and his wife ended up divorcing. Man, it was tragic. He said to me on the phone, he said, man, it was a tragedy. Uh, it is never God's intention, but you will never believe the things that God has done for it. Not that he wants it, not that he causes it, not that that's his intention, but he wastes no suffering. And he has used it to build me and our testimony uh, in the community and, and all of these things that he was listing that God has done. You, you know, the enemy came in and even with something that was hard and, and caused all of this stuff and wreaked havoc in this family. But at the same time, on the back side, we can look back and we can say, no, 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 there is still nothing. This always goes back to Pastor Gary's sermon a couple weeks ago. There is still nothing in the life of a believer that God can't use and that he can't redeem and that he can't move toward his ultimate end and his plan. And Paul says, I have become sure of this. I have become persuaded of this. Uh, that's the old school translation here, okay, of what he says. He says, I, that's the King James, okay. Uh, I was taught if the king ain't on it, the king ain't in it, okay. So it was, it was, uh, the, I, I am persuaded. It takes persuasion of the spirit to shake the fear of separation. Now he says in this text that I read from the ESV, I am sure. The King James Version says, I've been persuaded. The idea is I am not only convinced, but I am staying convinced that the spirit of God uh, is moving and that God is moving and that there's nothing that can separate me. You know, I think about this for many of you that maybe have been following this series. Hey, is the persuasion of the spirit beginning to drown out the commotion of the world? The commotion of the world that is speaking fear over separation from God into your life. Hey, are you a college student right now or somebody that's been kind of, maybe you were a little bit with us pre-COVID. Now you're kind of one that's, man, I catch the podcast every now and then. Are you on the fringe? Are you kind of ish? You know, one of the guys that we follow uh, with our financial stuff, Dave Ramsey here at Mercy Hill, ish is a wish, okay? Not committing and not diving all the way in. You're not placing yourself in the position to be able to be persuaded and convinced that there's nothing that can separate you and then allow you to, look, to run hard and live that truly free in Christ life. Hey, are you putting yourself in a position for God to grab you and knock the fear of separation loose out of your life? I understand that God saves, period. There's nothing that we do, nothing that we place ourselves in. God saves, period, I got it. But Diedrich Bonhoeffer said it like this, are you putting yourself in a place where faith is possible? Man, what is that step for you to get more in? Zoom groups are gonna kick off here in another month. Uh, maybe, you know, I don't know exactly if it, what other types of groups we're gonna have. Maybe we'll be back meeting by then, I pray. But something's gonna be kicking off, something that you can dive into. Man, the weekender's coming back around. There are so many things that you can put yourself in a place. I pray maybe even today, whatever platform you're seeing this on or listening on, you will fill out a connect card. Now, we're more than conquerors. Nothing can separate us. There is no hit coming that's big enough. And then he begins to list what those things are. Death, life, angels, rulers, things present, things to come, uh, power, height, depth. Okay, there's nothing that's created. None of these things are going to be able. He starts with this idea of death and life. You know, if you read the bunch of the Bible, you're gonna realize that Paul really views death as kind of the last and final enemy, yet he is already willing to say the sting of that has been removed. So much so that in Philippians 1, he talks about it being better to be with Christ than be here alive on this earth. I mean, for somebody like me who has feared death before, if you've ever seen kind of the darkness 
of anxiety or, or even depression tendencies or whatever, you're going to understand that, man, the idea of a fear of something health-related can be debilitating to you. And yet this life is possible where Paul would be able to say, no, 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 I would almost rather be there than here, where you don't have to fear death. Man, praise God that we can live that type of life. I think about uh, the fact that he doesn't just say death, he also says life. You know why? Because for many people, life is harder, isn't it? Life is what is filled with anxiety and depression. Life is what is filled with constantly things grabbing at you. I was reminded this week in my reading of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 30, where the writer says, man, I don't want to be rich because I'll forget God, but I don't want to be poor because I'll curse him. I mean, there is so much going on in this life that is grabbing at us and pulling us away all of the time. But the Bible says here, it's not death or life that can separate us. I think about even uh, suicide, a top 10 in our nation in terms of cause of death and all of that. Man, there is so much that goes into this idea of death and life for the believer. Not death, not life. There is no separation. It, can't, it cannot hit hard enough to make him drop you. Angels or rulers is what he says next. Things that work in the realm that we cannot see. Um, I would say it like this, Satan and demons are not concepts. They are combatants. They are real. They steal joy, cause havoc, feed lies. <clears throat> they accuse. But at the end of the day, <clears throat> their demonic power and the demonic forces and the spiritual forces. You know, later he doesn't just say angels and rulers. He also says powers. That's kind of the same idea, getting all the same idea, the demonic realm. The demonic forces make a lot of noise, but they have no power. Why? Because Colossians 2, 14 and 15 says, Jesus has disarmed them, disgraced them, and he has triumphed over them you know, believer, have you ever felt like you're under attack? You know why? It's probably because you were. The enemy comes and accuses, lies, depresses. The enemy causes physical problems. And we need to be praying about those things. We don't need to be so arrogant in the West. You know, the rest of the world don't think about this the way we do. We think about things in the West many times as if every single thing that we see has a physical cause and we think that that is intellectual elitism. Oh, we've arrived. We understand that there are no spiritual causes to things and yet we live in a society where homelessness reigns, addiction reigns. We see family breakup and we see violence. And we see all of these things. We see a foster care crisis. And yet we beat that drum that all that we ever see is something that is physical. It's arrogant. It's wrong. We are so much more than just physical beings. And we need to be praying against the enemy. We need to pray uh, against his demonic forces. But I'm going to tell you something right now. The answer here for Paul is not to try to wish away like we do in the West as if demonic forces aren't real, as if the demonic forces aren't powerful. The answer isn't to downplay Satan. The answer is to uplift our Savior. You're not going to find me downlift, you know, you're not going to find me downplaying Satan. You're not going to find somebody reading my palm. I'm just going to be honest with you. You're not going to find somebody doing tarot cards or a Ouija board or whatever. You're not going to see that around my life. Do you know why? Because it wouldn't shock me at all that somebody might know a bunch of stuff about me that there's no earthly way that they could know. Because they're not the only things that are in this world. They're not the only things that might be feeding. There could be things that are watching us, things that are trying to take us down. Now, I'm not messing around with that stuff. I would encourage you not to mess around with that stuff. We don't downplay Satan as if it's ha, ha, ha. What we do is we uplift our Savior and we realize, just like in death and life, he died for us, he rose for us. He is also disarmed and disgraced and triumphed over the demonic and spiritual forces that are in this world. The next thing he says is this, things present or things to come. Man, we've been through a lot over the last few months, church. You know this, and I just wonder what in the world is coming next in this giant Jumanji game that we're in. The Sahara dust cloud, okay, is now coming, and it's hurricane season. It's like, what else uh, can, can come for us? What we've got to realize today is that there is nothing present with us. Hey, what's present with you? Is it a worry about a wayward child a sickness, a financial trouble. And I think about our High Point campus just hit hard this past week with, man, you know, re car, uh, you know wrecks and, and physical things and, and people that we love at that campus, serve, people that are servants that have major surgeries. And I mean, yeah, that stuff is going on around our church all of the time. Tomorrow may be harder than it is today. Tomorrow may be easier than it is today. But either way, nothing can separate us from the love of God. You're talking about a God who holds the whole world in his hands. You're talking about a God who created. You're talking about Jesus Christ who, uh, you know, man, was from the beginning. That There's nothing that can separate us. And it gives us freedom. You know, it's actually one of my quotes from, uh, a quote from one of my favorite books. It says this, and what is coming will come and we will meet it when it does. Some of you Route 56, if you're Route 56 or if you were middle school and you can email me, my email is on the website. You email me personally 
Where that coat comes from, and I may or may not have a $5 gift card for you, okay? Uh, so you, you do that. I want you to throw that out. We're, we're three months into COVID. I want to see if anybody's still listening, okay? So you guys shoot me, <laughs> you shoot me something on the email. Uh, but man, whatever comes will come and we'll meet it when it does. Height nor depth, there is nothing we can, there's nowhere that we can go. Psalm 139 simply says, there is nowhere we can go. Height, depth, that's what it's getting at. There is, there's nowhere we can run that God is not there. And then he says this, finally, okay, and then we'll get into the application. Or any other created thing or anything in creation. I mean, if he hasn't said enough, affliction, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, nakedness, danger, sword, death, life, angels, powers, things present, things to come, height, depth, Okay, I mean, now he says any other created thing. It's like he's trying to say, hey, did I leave anything out? I need an umbrella policy here, okay? Did I leave anything else out? No. Uh, Well, if I did, any other created thing, Christian theology uh, 101, okay, is that if it is and it ain't God, it was created, okay? So if whatever it is in our life, it is a created thing, even you. Last time I checked, as much as we desperately try to cast God in our image, and you see this everywhere you look, we are still created in his image. You know, uh, God created us in his image. We try to return the favor, okay? But the reality is that God created us in his image. Even we are created. There is not one square inch of this world that God has not declared this is mine. What I want you to hear, believer, is not even you. Not even, if you are a Christian, not even you, not even your sin, not even your rebellion can take you from the hand of God. Now, listen, it all boils down to this. We're talking about the greatest chapter and the greatest letter and the greatest book in all the world. We've preached 12 sermons on this. It all comes down to this. Why is this list here? We started this journey by saying that Jesus brings more freedom, not less. And I wanna put flesh on it. I am free to run hard after the Christian life because I don't have to fear that something can take me away from God. It is simple, it is profound, yet all religions on the face of the planet except for one preach the opposite message. All religions on the face of the planet, they preach fear. Be afraid, that's how you stay close to God. Be afraid of sin, because if you're not, you know, he might, it might get you, it might take you away. Be afraid of death, it might take you away. Be afraid of riches, it might get you. Be afraid of demons, it might get you. That's every religion on the face of the planet. And then the gospel that says there is nothing that is gonna get you, because it was never based on how tight you can hold on. It was based on how tight he can hold on. And the mighty hands of God don't let go. I think about this, uh, man, if you ever go to the beach with young kids, you know, it's, it's fun. Like, you know, they like to get out in the waves and they're holding on and the waves will hit, you know, and you're jumping over the waves and, and, and you've probably done that before. You know, what I've learned in that is like, man, for a five-year-old kid, the wave don't have to be that big for them to let go of you. But I'm going to tell you something. It would take about a tsunami for me to let go of one of them, right? And I think about this with God. Man, it, when we have... Through the gospel, here's what we know. The mighty hands of God are holding on to our union with Christ. And when we get that in our bones, in the greatest chapter, in the greatest letter, in the greatest book in all the world, it changes the way we live. In the gospel, the mighty hands of God are holding on to our union with Christ. Jesus lived for us and died for us. He did so to erase our sin debt, but then he raised to new life and gave us the ability through our faith to join him in his resurrection. And our assurance of that relationship, remember what I said in the beginning, the identity it gives us and the future it promises, okay? Our assurance of those two things is not based on how much we can love him and how much we can hold on to him. It is based on him holding on to us. It is based on him never quitting us. How do we know? Because if he didn't quit on the cross, then he's not gonna quit now. If he wouldn't abandon you then, he will not abandon you now. If we look back at Jesus Christ and we realize on the cross, hell itself was bearing down on him and he didn't let go then. You know what, when we sin and have a bad week, when the demonic realm seeks sin and begins to accuse, when the phone rings and we've got something bad on the other end, terrible news, Man, if he didn't let go then, he's not gonna let go now. And that freedom creates the radically normal Christian life. Hey, last application of this whole series, fear nothing because nothing has the power to separate you from God, all right? Now, of course, this is only true for the believer. And I wanna be very clear with that. We have people in our church right now that are walking away from the faith. We have people in our church right now that our elder teams are having to initiate something called church discipline. That's a bad, it sounds like a bad word or whatever. No, it's not. All right, church discipline is the idea that we say in a last ditch effort to get you to wake up to what you are doing, 
we are willing to turn away from you in order to get you to turn away from your sin. And that's happening. That happens at Mercy Hill some, and, and we see that. We have to walk down that road. It's heartbreaking when it does. But look, if you're walking away from God, if you're separated from Christ, it means that you were never joined, okay? Because nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. If you get separated, it's because you were never joined. Now, for some that are walking away right now, time's going to tell if you're willing to turn, if you're willing to come back. I pray that you will, but for the believer, we can fear absolutely nothing because the power to separate you from the love of God does not exist. There is nothing out there that is strong enough to do that. You who are Christians, though, some of us, and I've been there before myself, we end up living in fear. We live in fear that something's going to separate us, namely sin, suffering, Satan. We think these things can separate us from the love of God. And I just want to call you in one last push. Nothing can sever the love of God from your life. You know, I, I uh, man, I remember when we got our tractor, um, I was, uh, I don't know, within like one day, Anna kept staring, Anna kept catching me staring uh, at this huge rock in the middle of our yard, massive rock, okay? And, and she's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, man, I've got to know if the tractor can pick this rock up. And she's like, why? And I'm like, I, I don't know why. I know I have to know though. <laughs> you know, I know I've got to know. I mean, straight up. I mean, within one day, another guy from Mercy Hills over there, we got this whole thing rigged up and we've messed with the hydraulics and we've got it all chained and just to see if we can get it one inch off the ground because I just got to know, right? And so uh, it was so funny. When, when we lifted the rock up off the ground, I remember my boys were out there and they kept saying, man, they're like, you're going to break the chain. You're going to break the chain. And I remember telling them later, I said, guys, the rock might break or the tractor might break, but that chain ain't going to break, okay? The, uh, the chain that I got, it was not going to break. There was nothing in this situation that is going to snap that chain. Now, is that chain breakable? Um, I'm sure something could break it, and that gives me a good idea for what I'm doing next weekend. Okay, we're going to find out maybe. But I just think about like, uh, you know, is that chain breakable? Yes. The point is, though, man, when you come to the love of God, there is nothing that can break the chain. There is no hit that can separate you. There is no wave big enough. There is no uh, rock big enough that's going to snap the chain of his love. He never lets go. Nothing can sever us. And if we can get that into our bones, we will stop all this living in fear and we will start living in freedom. And when we live in freedom, we will run hard after what God has for us. All right. It's got to get down deep into our life it will change us when it does. Let me conclude like this, okay? Let me talk to the believer and let me talk to the unbeliever. Hey, to the believer first, those of us who are, man, you're, you're living the Christian life, man, you would say, I am joined with Christ. Man, does your life smack of the radical normal Christian life? Things that the world says are crazy that the Christian says are normal. And if you say, man, I, I don't know if my life don't look much different than the rest of the world or whatever, Maybe it's even a little bit boring. I'm just kind of a Christian from heritage or identity. What do you need to do, y'all? You need to dwell on the love of God in your life and the unbreakable chain, the wave that cannot take you away, the strong father in his hands. Man, that idea of no hit separating you, you need to dwell there. You need to get that in your mind. That's why we tell you to join a community group. That's why we tell you to go through the weekender. That's why we tell you to get on our Bible reading plan. We're, we don't do these things just to have exercises for people to do. All they are is inspiring the dream of living with God in a place that he has prepared among our brothers and sisters from every tribe, tongue, and nation. When we are inspired by that dream, you know, my kids, um, my kids are super, uh, man, they love the Nerf guns, blasters. I meant blasters, okay? They're, you, that's, they're not Nerf guns, they're blasters. Gotta be super PC, okay? But I think about the fact that they love these new rival, right? they, they're called Nerf rival blasters, and they don't shoot a dart, they shoot a ball. These things are incredible. You can pick a kid off at 30 yards, take their feet right off from under them, okay? Uh, it's, they're incredible. And I, I think about them, and uh, I think about my kids. They love them. They watch these videos of them they want to do. And I think about how much their life begins to kind of line up. Like, all of a sudden, when they got the Nerf Rival Blaster in their mind, it's like, well, now I want to work. Now I want to do some chores around the house. When I got the knife Nerf Rival Blaster in my mind, and, and Daddy's going to come home, and we're going to have a battle, it's like I don't want to get in trouble. You know, I, I have that dream in my mind. Our life sort of aligns, it's not, a, it's not a perfect analogy, it's not one to one, but just the general concept, y'all, of the Bible reading and the community group and all this stuff, inspiring a dream of living under God's sight without sin and having that kind of align our life up to that reality now. The things that we see then starting to work out and play now, man, if that's what we're going to do then, living among our brothers and sisters with no sin and no tears, man, we want to get that party started now. It just begins to kind of line our life up, right? 
And that's kind of what the Bible and groups and all of that do. Man, it's not about rules. It's not a, man, it's about inspiring the dream that makes us want to lean in more to what God is doing in our life. And I pray that you will dwell more there. Hey, but some of you guys, man, you're not believers. It's time for you to maybe return to the faith if you're separated. As I said, man, if you're separated, is it because you were never joined? Others of you, man, it's not about a return to the faith. It's about a one-time, first-time commitment. You've been watching our stuff, and you've probably been watching other churches' stuff. Man, God is after you. He's moving in your life. You're right on the line of whether you are going to be fully persuaded or whether you're going to retreat and run back to what you know in fear. And I want to call you, man, accept Christ today. Step over the line. Become a believer. The gospel is as simple as this. Y'all, Jesus in my place. He took what we deserved over sin so that we could have what he deserved. Man, to live in the kingdom with God forever with our brothers and sisters under God's sight. This is the gospel, and I pray that you would accept it today. It's as simple as repenting of your sin, confessing your sin, confessing a belief in Jesus Christ as our Savior, that he is God's Son, that he died on the cross, that he rose from the dead, that he did all this for us. Man, confessing those things and, and saying, God, you're the Lord of my life. I pray that some of you, uh, even today, right now, would take that step. And if you do, I want you to text BAPTIZE to 41411, okay? Man, with these outdoor services and all that, we're going to be thinking about baptism here in the coming weeks. And there is absolutely no reason why we shouldn't have dozens of texts coming through that say, man, over the course of this series, I've given my life to Christ. I believe in what he's done for me. And I want to take that next step of obedience. So you guys text BAPTIZE to 41411. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity, and uh, God, I pray that this teaching from Romans 12, that will get all the way down into our bones, months we have been in this one chapter, I pray it'll get down into our bones, that we will see Jesus Christ came to bring more freedom, not less. In Christ's name, amen.